Hello, members and friends, and welcome to the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's Astrophotography Special mm -hmm. Interest Group meeting. That is a mouthful. So, as usual, let's just jump right into it. We have a very special uh, member guest speaker tonight. So uh, tonight's featured speaker is an amateur astronomer and automotive engineer residing in Saline, Michigan. After completing his graduate and undergraduate work at the University of Michigan, he has held several engineering management and senior management positions at Toyota Motor North America. He began his astronomical interest as a student at KMZ under the no doubt uh, tutelage of uh, Mike Sinclair, who couldn't join us tonight and has focused his efforts on imaging the night sky for the past seven years. And of course, he'll be speaking on his uh, efforts um, to image the night sky tonight. So without further ado, welcome uh, Jonathan Young. All right, thank you, Richard, for the introduction. Let me move to the screen share. All right, are you guys getting the PowerPoint? All right. All right. Uh, so I'll try to touch on several topics today. Uh, it ranges from a set of kind of more introductory topics, and moving to some more advanced and even a little bit of math along the way. Um, so we can speed up or slow down as we go. Uh, if there's any uh, questions, feel free to kind of speak up along the way. But between slides is is fine, uh, and I'll answer. So we'll start with. Um, already kind of covered the introduction. Uh, had a lot of telescopes along the way. Imaging has been pretty recent. Uh, for my imaging equipment itself, uh, I'm using a telescope engineering company, APO 140, uh, for my main scope. Uh, I also have a William Optic Star 71 uh, on the other end of the uh, EQ6 mount. This is the, the belt-driven uh, AZ-EQ variant. Uh, for cameras, um, on the William Optics, I primarily run a Canon 60DA. It's getting pretty old now, uh, but it is filter modified, so it, it does pull out a lot of the H alpha. And then on the tech side, I've recently upgraded from an ASI 1600 uh, to a QHY 268M, uh, which is an APS-C size sensor and really, really good um, noise profile in the background. For filters, I'm running the 36 uh, millimeter Astrodons um, and they've been great uh, so far. Um, and everything is, stays assembled, um, built my own wire harness, put it on a scope buggy, which is by far the best purchase uh, that I've made for this. Just sits in the garage, roll it out, good to go in about 10, 20 minutes. Um, fully aligned and tracking. So uh, definitely recommend uh, this sort of setup if you don't have your own uh, roll off roof. Um, one thing I want to note is that I ha have had a lot of improvements since I added a robust uh, off axis guider uh, to my setup. Uh, it improved my uh, eccentricity quite a bit. And it, you know, for those of you that are sticklers on stars, I, I think this is key. And in the big yeah. picture, if I was going to do it again, uh, actually, there's not too much I would do, right? I, I'd love it to be a little faster. I'd love to go with the slightly bigger sensor. Um, but really, to get all of that uh, in Michigan means stepping all the way up to something like the plane wave Delta Rho or the AP Riccardi Honda's scopes that, at the end of the day, are just $50,000 setups. So um, getting pretty good results. But I have probably wouldn't change too much. Um, for those of you just starting out, I do want to kind of emphasize that you don't really need to have a big elaborate setup. Um, I know we all love to have them, but you can get pretty good results uh, with DSLR and using the same processing techniques. I think the big difference is, is when I started with the DSLR, my processing skills were not good and, you know, was kind of disappointed and jumped into buying more and more expensive things quickly. Uh, but in retrospect, going back, you know, I can, these are just out of the Canon 60DA uh, on the William Optics. They're, you know, maybe six hours or so, throw away half the subs, just keep the good ones. But you can get really good results uh, with the DSLR and uh, anything that's reasonably tracked. Um, moving into the bigger jump beyond a DSLR, this is where I'll get into the 
the Tech Apo and my old camera, the ASI 1600. Uh, really to get good images and to go deep on most of these, you know, you're looking at, you know, 15, 20 hours uh, to get enough integration to really pull out those details and can't really appreciate the details on these screens, but these are really uh, full resolution, you know, 5,000 by 4,000 pixel uh, images that you can zoom in pretty well. And it, I feel the star profile pretty much matches what's limited by scene uh, for many of these. Uh, moving to the new camera, you know, I mentioned the previous ones are all, you know, like 15 hours on average. Um, this batch here is really done uh, on four, about four hours, really, of total integration. And the reason this was possible is the new camera, the 268M, has such a low noise profile and low, low thermal uh, challenge to it, coupled with almost a 90% QE, and it's about as good as you can get. And I def definitely recommend this class of Sony sensor over the ASI variant. There's big improvement uh, directly. And I'll get into some of that later with the calibration frames and those comparisons. Um, so the first topic I'll cover then is managing local sky conditions. Uh, really signal variance by elevation, how to kind of plan around your local light pollution, uh, the moon that we were just talking about at the beginning of this, uh, what does it really do in, in terms of the signal? Um, the variable seeing conditions you get, um, target selection has uh, a big thing to do with your success. Um, for those of you that have, have not tried it, uh, you can actually image when it's quite smoky in the middle of the summer. Uh, you just have to be kind of selective on which filters you're using. And then, of course, all sorts of things that go wrong because that's what happens to us in the middle of the night. Uh, so the first topic then is really with sky condition and elevation. And uh, just to confirm, uh, this is the full screen variant, right? It's not windowed version. Is that correct? You're not full screen in your presentation, if, if that's what you mean. OK, but in terms of the monitor screen, it is? Yes. Yeah. OK, perfect. All right. Um, I think everyone is aware, but as objects are rising from the horizon, there's different effects of atmospheric distortion. And it's really wavelength dependent. So your reds and, to some extent, greens are going to be coming through with less distortion than your blues. And you can use that in your favor uh, when the object is low in the horizon and, and moving up. So typically what I would do is I kind of look at my target, consider uh, what signals will be the weakest and bias those towards the red. And typically I would do, for example, a red for the first couple hours as it approaches you know, 40, 45 degrees or so. Uh, if I'm doing narrow band, I would do an S, uh, sulfur just because the signal's so weak there and you end up binning it significantly and processing to pull out any detail. The next key point with that is air mass, right? So, th and this is really a key point. That air mass is going to amplify scene effects. It's going to add some distortion and halos around stars. So for your high resolution images, they need to be high. Uh, for high resolution and processing, it really means your luminance layer, you know, whether it's H, A, or L. Those are the filters you have to prioritize and give the best uh, relative angle to the sky. So uh, for air mass, for example, 45 degrees, uh, you're going to be looking through almost 40% more air than straight overhead. But at 60 degrees, you're twice. And if you're really going near the horizon, you might be you know, four or five times the atmospheric thickness. So you can't expect good results on high resolution if it's near the horizon. And you can kind of see that uh, in my Lagoon Nebula. It looks OK at this resolution. But if I zoom in, there's a lot of noise. It's a little blurry. I had to really over sharpen the core. Um, and with the DSLR side, this is. Um, you know, the row uh, and surroundings, uh, really, really difficult to get enough signal to pull those out. It's a big reduction in quality compared to those other uh, pictures I had on the previous page, which were essentially shot straight overhead. All right, so if it's low, shoot red or S2. Um, the next example is really uh, something I shot uh, just a couple months ago. 
but this is NGC uh, 1333. It's the uh, kind of in the Perseus cloud star forming region. But you can see from these DSLR outputs, you know, if I start the image at 10 p.m., it's frames basically white. And it gets a little bit closer to gray as it rises. And then you can see some clouds coming through and heavy haze, even though it was supposedly a clear night. Um, it's really important to understand these scene conditions as, as they happen, right? It, you have the brightness near the horizon that you need to avoid. But once you're over 40 degrees, you should be pretty good. But you might have some subs that you still have to throw out or use a really low weight on uh, as they will reduce your final sharpness in your image. So this is really important. Uh, I do like to use telescopias to help plan my targets and definitely consider the, you know, the transit time across the meridian. So really important to understand this. And this is another big reason I like to uh, piggyback the DSLR and, and the narrow band imaging at the same time, because it, it will allow me to cull uh, some of those subs uh, from the narrow narrow band stack, or at least move them just to the color channels and not to the luminance. All right, the next topic then is light pollution. Um, I think everyone knows that, you know, we live in Southern Michigan, it's kind of automation alley. There's a lot of factories, parking lots, and really there's nothing that's dark uh, south of Cadillac. You, you really got to go north in Michigan uh, to get really good skies. Uh, but that being said, there's big variance uh, around uh, all of our imaging sites. And one of the rules I have, I know uh, it's kind of a common rule of thumb, but uh, you need to swamp the renoise noise of your sensor. And I have found that anything less than 10 times that swamp factor on a CMOS sensor, uh, you'll still get uh, noise creeping up out of it. So really 10 is the minimum I shoot for with narrow band and for any L red, green, blue, but that's not really a problem there. Uh, the next part of it is, okay, well, what does this brightness really mean? And for example, we look, okay, downtown Kalamazoo might be a mortal seven. You know, you move a little bit outside of that, it's mortal six. There's a lot of this area is mortal five and mortal four. And the overall range might go from a magnitude 21 and a half if you're kind of out near Hillsdale. Um, or it might creep all the way up to that 18 and a half in Kalamazoo, but that, that's three steps in magnitude. Uh, that's really equivalent to, you know, about 13, 14 times total brightness difference, and that's going to affect the background signal uh, quite significantly. So with that, this is kind of the first table that has some math on it. Um, Really understanding your local sky conditions is key to setting how long you need to expose and how much total exposure you need. So I have this table here. I have my broadband subs and then my narrowband subs. And I have a couple varying, varying sky conditions. I have new moon for a couple and then one over Ann Arbor, which is very close to my house and very bright just to the north. I also have a combination with the quarter moon more towards Toledo, but Toledo is a good 40 miles away. So it's really low impact. And then I have the case of the new moon at Zenith. And what I've done in this table, right, is I've taken my sensor characteristics in yellow, you know, the, the pixel area through my scope, uh, the band pass of the filter, the ADU ratio. So, you know, you have your 65,000 uh, number 16 bit, bit uh, item that you need to reduce through the ADU sensor. So to get your actual electrons and then you have your quantum efficiency of your camera. Uh, I then have the measured uh, light frame and my dark frame. So if I look at my average background and my dark, I can get a signal uh, that includes the background. Uh, I can then calculate my electrons, my filter flux, and then finally my sky flux. So the key point is that I'm a mortal five on a new moon, which is gives me a flux of about six electrons um, at the sky level per second, right? When that goes through a narrow band filter, I'm really only getting, you know, a couple electrons in the end through a 300 second exposure. I go to a quarter moon, 
that increased another 12 or so. And then I aim over Ann Arbor, which is, you know, another magnitude above where I'm at. And it also increases by another 10. So all of this is, you know, from my backyard and it can change significantly. So you can't necessarily use one setting uh, to have the best results all the time. All right. Um, so we've gotten through, okay, we, we know when we have to shoot. We know where we shoot uh, relative to local sky pollution is important. Uh, how about the target itself? Um, there's a lot of information on here, but uh, really what I found is that I don't have to do a meridian flip on my telescope if the object transits to the south at an elevation below 75 degrees. And I can really go another three hours past meridian, but I also wanna stop uh, imaging when I get into astronomical twilight. So this means I can pick targets that transit four or five hours uh, before sunrise, which is great. It means I don't need to wake up in the middle of the night to do a meridian flip. And if I have an automatic meridian flip set, I don't have to lose a peace of mind that maybe it won't work or something will malfunction. I think anyone that's been doing these uh, long exposure imaging for a long time knows that auto flips sometimes don't work and you will have a peer crash and, and you might have some hardware damage when that happens. So just for peace of mind, I like to pick targets, uh, again, using Telescopius to identify targets to the south uh, that cross the, or basically transit about four to five hours before sunrise. And then to the north, I just pick targets that would transit about two hours before sunrise. And, basically close to my alarm time. I'll just get up and stop the scope before any issues. Um, this, ha this is okay for most of the year because when we consider the amount of time the object is in the air relative to daylight, I mean, summer at most we have uh, seven hours of actual what's considered night, but when we, cons but we consider actual imaging night, it's only three hours. Right, so you, you don't wanna waste time doing a meridian flip, realigning, uh, taking additional, you know, any plate solving images or any, um, any focusing images you don't have to do. So really in the summer, uh, which really goes from May through August, just pick one target image all night, avoid the meridian flips if you can. In the winter, it's long enough, you have to pick two targets anyway, uh, because it's very rare for any target to actually be far enough above the horizon um, during that time of year that you can image. It has to be very far north or basically circumpolar to do that. Uh, the other issue is we're in Michigan. Um, I know we've had a lot of clouds. Uh, it's also shown from these sunshine graphs and you can see it always swoops down around the Midwest, meaning that there's always clouds or high moisture limiting uh, the actual uh, clear sky that we have above us. So those remote telescopes out in New Mexico or some of the other services in California or Chile, that, that's really why um, people get pushed to that in the long run. Um, I found I've only been able to image maybe 25 nights per year uh, with good success. There's several other nights you can image, but you might only have a two hour window. Two hour window or there may be some um, other issues uh, with the local weather. Uh, getting rained on, uh, shorting out equipment, those sorts of things are never fun. So how about variable scene conditions? Um, one thing in Michigan is, you know, I've seen a lot of people hoping that they can get those super high resolution images, you know, that you see on Astrobin and the ones that are winning awards. But in the end, that's actually very difficult to do here. Uh, the very, very best nights have a scene of maybe 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 seconds, but average is really one and a half to two. Um, and it really should play into what uh, scopes you're using, right? If you go for a high resolution, uh, you need a very long integration time to get enough photon photons on each pixel. But if you kind of just acknowledge that, yeah, my resolution is going to be limited, maybe one and a half, two, maybe even three arc seconds, uh, matching your equipment to that is going to get you much more signal and increase your signal to noise per pixel much more quickly. And what I have here, this is a graph of my last 500 narrowband subs. 
And this top one, you can't really read the label, but this is the, you know, F, the FWHM measurements. Uh, it's basically averaging about two and then jumps up to three, uh, kind of once we get to the smoky season in the summer. The second point is the eccentricity, which is basically running at about a 0 0.6 average for me, which is really not that great. I mean, you really want it to be about 0.5 or better. Uh, otherwise, your stars look a little, have a little bit of an ovalness to them. Um, they do tend to kind of round out in processing, but it, there is a reasonable expectation here that needs to be matched. So, you know, really, really good seeing that results in uh, really small um, star profiles, uh, really not so realistic. Most are gonna be between two and three arc seconds and really you should match your sensor and your scope uh, to the kind of more or less reasonable expectations. Um, so I mentioned there's a big shift up here during kind of the smoky part of the summer. And it does come into play that the smoke is gonna cause um, your star pro profiles to expand. You know, heavy haze is gonna cause the same thing. And there's a theory behind how to make use of your imaging during this time. Um, the color channels really in that case are less noticeable to the human eye. Any detail in it, high frequency, it, our eyes are just not as sensitive to color as they are to uh, bright and dark contrast. And you can use that to your advantage um, to kind of avoid those H alpha and luminance frames uh, during these times. The second thing to remember is that when we combine uh, those color channels, you know, sulfur and oxygen, uh, because the signal is so weak, we often end up binning either on hardware or processing uh, to bring that signal out. So again, we're already sacrificing the detail. Uh, therefore, it doesn't really matter that we've lost some of the detail through this kind of smoky atmosphere. So you can keep that in mind. You don't have to just lock your equipment up. You can go out if you're just taking the color layers. So what are other things that can go wrong? Um, just several examples over here. This is an image uh, that I had where my dew heater uh, failed and I got a basically a light uh, dew across the objective. Uh, the moon was just out of the frame. So I actually got this really cool, you know, kind of technicolor view to it, but it, it was basically unusable. Um, another example of the sensor frosting. Um, so this outside ring was actually quite clear, but the whole center of the frame, which actually mattered, uh, was did end up frosting. This was inside the camera itself and needed to have the desiccant replaced. Um, this is an example of flex between guide cam and camera. It also looks like fo focus or slip, but at the end of the day, having a good hardware tied together is great. And in my case, I went with an off-axis guider, which is very uh, robust and doesn't have any slippage. And then finally, you have to be prepared for rain. Um, I was caught off guard on this one, just quickly threw a, one of those tents out. Not fully waterproof, so it wasn't an ideal solution. Uh, needed to throw some towels under there too, but if you have a telegismo cover, um, anytime you might be set up for multiple nights, it's good to have one of those handy. Only once have I had uh, my lawn sprinklers hit my equipment. <laughs> but uh, only lost one power supply, none of the expensive goodies. So covered a lot of things. So what's the best thing we can do? Well, these are some of the more high resolution zoom-ins that I have. So this is out of, you know, Mark Herring's chain. I got the, the eyes cropped and zoomed in here, but there's actually a ton of detail on this and I could really stretch this more. Um, let me bring it to the front. There's quite a bit of detail uh, that is in this. And th this is a really small, you know, maybe eight arc minute uh, field of view right here. You know, same with the uh, rosette. Uh, this is kind of the oil slick uh, in the North American nebula. You know, a lot of wispiness in here, but the key thing is this resolution 
at the end of the day is still about a one and a half arc second uh, detail level resolution. So it, it's not as sharp as you'd see in those galaxy images again from you know Chile or New Mexico. So what's reasonable with this? Well, if you use a very high resolution image, uh, you're going to have trouble with the mount uh, with good guiding. You're going to have trouble with your hardware to keep it from flexing. That's why people buy the really expensive scopes that have a lot of engineering uh, into the structures. Um, but, you know, it really in the end will come down to your mount. So what's the theory behind it? Um, again, taking all those numbers from before, I have my scope, um, which looking at red, my H alpha wavelength has a 0 0.9 arc second fraction limit. Um, the camera sensor comes out to 1.1 arc second resolution. My guiding RMS, just for reference, is usually between a 0.5 and a 0.7 RMS uh, on any given night. And again, the scene is really between one and two. So if I do a kind of a 3D error on my best nights, you know, I'd ex expect to see about a 1.8 uh, arc second. And on my average nights, I'd expect to see about 2.6. You know, this is just from the individual measurements, but I did show back here that that's effectively where I am on the actual measured data. So it does seem to hold true. And if I went through here and if I reduce my guiding and I reduce the scene, yeah, I might pull the best number down to maybe a 1.2 or so, uh, but it's not down at very, very, very low, very sharp numbers. So the next thing then is, okay, how would you resample this? Well, you know, you can do a two time sample, a four time sample, but as I mentioned, every time you cut this in half, you're going to increase your imaging time by four. I'm like, do you, re you're not going to get enough signal per pixel to be able to extract that detail. So you'll get to processing, it'll be too dim, you'll have to bin your image in processing. Um, so it's really important to be really ideally is somewhere around a two to three time sampling for whatever your star profile ends up being. So something to check. Um, you don't want to be in a condition where you're really oversampling your star profile. Right, I mentioned uh, guiding expectations. Um, again, I'm using an EQ6 class, which has um, kind of half arc second on the upper end, but you can go cheaper systems. You can go more expensive systems. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is when you go more expensive, it gets heavier, it gets harder to move, so it's not so user-friendly. Uh, the EQ6 I have is on a scope buggy because really it's bigger than I'd want to move any night. And if you're really looking at portability, you know, you need an EQ5 class or you can even use like a Sky Guider or one of those AZ GTIs. Uh, knowing that your guiding will be, you know, a little bit worse, maybe it'll be in the one to two arc second range. Uh, but that's fine if you put a, a matching scope on it. You know, if you're going to use a camera lens or you're going to use a, you know, 250 millimeter, 300 millimeter focal length telescope, uh, that's perfectly fine uh, for these sky guiders. Um, so if you're just getting started, definitely recommend that. If uh, you're already heavily invested, um, absolutely, you can go up uh, to much higher and higher levels, get perfect guiding. Um, but at the same time, that also comes with a lot of other uh, considerations um, for storage and uh, kind of matching the rest of your equipment. Um, one of the notes, um, you know, I mentioned that, well, I am using a focal reducer. I'm using the quad TTC on my tech. And the reason I did that is when I was imaging at a 0.8 arc second scale, uh, I had pretty pretty eccentric stars, you know, they were around a 0 0.65, 0 0.7, uh, and it ended up being uh, significantly worse uh, than these new numbers. My new numbers, you know, the average maybe uh, 2.2 uh, for star profile and a 1.2 uh, arc second eccentricity. And this is almost half of what it was without the focal reducer. So my limit for my mount in the end is about an imaging scale of a 1.1 arc second. 
So where does that get us? Um, you know, again, it really comes down to what you want to image. Uh, galaxies really need to be imaged at that one arc second per pixel or less. Uh, detailed nebula, any planetary, like large planetaries or uh, any of the kind of brighter emission nebula really like anywhere from one to two, uh, which gives you a big range. And then you have the big gas fields, um, dust clouds that really want a, a large field of view. Uh, so if you're looking at, you know, various combinations, you know, I have some cameras up here, a pretty standard DSLR with six uh, micron pixels, uh, the old uh, 8300 CCDs, um, an ASI 1600, a QHI 268M. I have got the pixel size here, and then I have several different potential scopes, right? All the way from a camera lens, um, a relatively inexpensive refractor, uh, the tech going up to a Schmidt, and uh, to some more exotic systems. Uh, and again, these are shorter focal length exotic systems. And you can see the resolution for a lot of these using the latest cameras is really small. It's gonna be hard to get uh, this level of true resolution out of your pictures. Um, so it's something to consider uh, when you're looking at new sensors and what scope you're gonna pair it with. The next thing that comes with that is I mentioned imaging speed uh, is a reference, right? So I will go through an example later on a broadband and a narrowband on the relative effect of those filters and what they do to imaging speed. But if you look at, again, the camera pixel size, the relative quantum efficiency of the camera and the combination of focal ratio and central obstruction that you might have, uh, if I take uh, my current condition with the tech and if I go for really dim broadband, I need about 20 hours of exposure. Um, if I go for really detailed narrow band, you know, maybe I only need four hours of exposure on this number. But if I look at the speed of some of these other systems, you know, if I just want to do a standard eight inch Schmidt on it with a focal reducer, you know, it's going to be half the speed of my current setup. Uh, which means I'll have, if I'm going to image a detailed galaxy, that's 40 hours just for one object. It, it doesn't really uh, work out in my favor uh, with the light pollution that I currently have. So keep that in mind. Uh, a lot of factors come into uh, your choice of how you want to do your imaging setup. Uh, next, uh, calibration. Um, calibration is really critical for all the imaging that you do. Uh, this is an example, five minute luminance sub, again, of NGC uh, 1333. It's very, very dim in the end. And you, we, besides the bright core, the detail expands all the way out to the edge of this frame, but it's completely buried in the noise. Uh, we have, in this case where I put these yellow stars, if I measure the difference between signal and the background sub, I only have uh, about eight electrons in a five minute sub that I'm trying to extract detail out of. So I, I have to eliminate the fixed pattern noise. I have to eliminate the amp glow, uh, any, any variation in pixel response. That's, that's really key with your flats in the end. It's, it's not really just getting rid of any shadow that you have or dust motes. It's really to correct the pixel to pixel variation, which can be up to 10% but that 10% is definitely more than eight electrons, right? Um, hear a lot about dark libraries and dark frames. Um, it's very important with uh, the previous generation CMOS cameras, the ASI 1600 had a lot of amp glow and a lot of creep uh, in the, the background between your exposure lengths. So this is an ASI 1600 uh, moving from a 120 second exposure to a 450 second exposure. You can see amp glow is really creeping in. All this amp glow does add noise to your image. Uh, so it works the same as any increase in background noise. This above one is the 268M and you can see it's completely clean. It's, these are fully stretched image. You can see the fixed pattern noise um, very clearly and there's zero amp glow, which I've been quite pleased with. It also means that I can effectively use uh, the same dark 
whether it's 300 seconds or 600 seconds, I actually don't have to build a dark library. I just need one set of darks uh, that I can reuse for months at a time. Uh, flat frame variation, again, I, I mentioned the pixel to pixel intensity. So this has zero stretch to it. And you can see there is a little bit of kind of cross hatching, scratching to it. That's kind of critical, a couple dust motes uh, down there, but it's really that pixel to pixel variation. You have to do flats. Um, if you disassemble your equipment night after night, you have to do it every single time. Uh, if you have a permanent setup or a semi-permanent, like my roll off type, you can reuse your flats for a while, um, assuming your filter wheel ends up in the same position consistently. That, that's one thing that's uh, variable by brand. Um, but in the big picture, that pixel variation is key. And I would definitely recommend uh, increasing your flat frame count. Um, 30 is kind of the minimum, 40 to 50 is better. Uh, if you're using dark flats instead of bias, which I think is the preferred method as well for seeing those cameras, um, really getting up to 80, 90, 100 dark frames, I have seen a benefit in the end result of my pictures all the way up to 100. But again, 30 is kind of the minimum if you're short on time. You can go all the way up to 100 and you'll still see some benefit. So I know we're talking about narrowband, but I'm going to go through some of the key points on a red, green, blue image as well uh, because it feeds directly into narrowband and the benefits. Um, so this is the end result of um, a quick process yeah, going through surreal or Cyril to extract the background, do the calibration, running through my star tools routine, which I'll also touch on in a little bit, and then how to do the color ba balancing as well. So jumping through this, okay, what are we doing with our images in the end? We're really trying to make an image match a contrast profile that's pleasing. And the best way to view this is there's three things we have to adjust in our eye, right? We have our pupil size, which is basically aperture. We have our brain, and then we have the chemical adjustments that happen in our eye, which is actually the most critical aspect of it. Because when we're looking at a picture, we're looking at a static scene. Uh, our eyes have the ability to really see, you know, a million different contrast levels, but that's dynamically. Once we focused in on an object, we're really limited to maybe, you know, 100, maybe 200 levels. Uh, just from the chemistry of our eye and how it adjusts. So by looking at our contrast level, we actually have a target of what our histogram needs to look, at, look like in any of our red, green, blue images, in any of our narrow brand images. We need to get to this roughly 200 contrast steps level. So how does this play out? Well, this is these aren't my images. This is just a snapshot of several image of the days from last month. And we see actually all the histograms are, they're different, but they're not that different, right? The first peak's roughly at 10%. Uh, there's a little bit of an extension to 20 to 25, which has a lot of the detail. And then it falls off pretty quick. And by the time you get to 50%, most of these images don't really have any, um, you know, any pixels in that range of brightness. So if we're making a plan, okay, let's take a good example of an image we like. Uh, this is again, that NGC 1333 from, that I borrowed from Mount Lemon Sky Center, which is actually one of Adam Block's images, I believe. And I look at this, okay, if, I, if I'm gonna make a 200 level image, but I'm gonna cram all of my histogram into maybe 40 or 50 levels, that means I can kind of look at this and be like, okay, so this will be 40 levels here and I'll be 10 levels way out here. Well, let's take one sub and look at this. Okay, here's my sub. Here's my actual uh, measured uh, ADUs. And then I have my background, which is basically 2990. And I'm looking at all these numbers. Okay, this is 3008. It's another 3008, maybe 3016. I only have 40 levels of ADU, but I have two and a half ADUs per electron. So I'm really looking at signals of just nine to 10 electrons that I need to turn into 10 levels. So then that comes down to signal to noise, right? So signal to noise, again, is I think everyone has seen this equation. It's 
the same one, but it's basically your object signal times your number of subs divided by the square root of your number of subs times the object signal plus the sky fog signal. That sky fog signal was key. That's why narrow band is so great is this noise from sky fog basically goes to zero in your dark current and your read noise. So if I'm looking at that one example frame with these signal levels here, I can calculate that it takes almost 20 hours of sub exposures to get my 10 levels of signal to noise that I want in the background out here. All right, so that's 20 hours just for uh, one picture on just my luminance frame. So that, that's a pretty big expense for my Bortle 5. But if you're to Bortle 4, you know, you're a whole magnitude darker, you know, that 20 hours becomes eight hours. That's actually manageable at that point. So, you know, Bortle 4, eight hours, Bortle 3, you can get the same picture in about two and a half hours. So if you're gonna do L, the L red, green, blue images, if you're gonna shoot galaxies, if your skies are dark, then great, you'll have a lot of fun with it. If you're near the city, man, that's painful. It's a lot of nights to get that many good subs. So where does this come in? Again, you know, I'm looking at my uh, subs um, for it. You know, I've had to image on four straight nights, it took 28 hours of total data, uh, calibrated all of it. And the software I use actually is Surreal. I used to use Deep Stacker. I have Pix Insight. I've stacked in there as well. Uh, but Surreal is free and it's actually processes faster than Pix Insight. And it has essentially all the key features you need. So one thing is I did take for all my images, I took a mix of exposure lengths, you know, this 180 second subs, 300 second subs, 600 second subs. Typically that's a real pain to calibrate and process, but there's a new uh, linear fit clipping that was input into PixInsight and a Surreal, you know, a couple of years ago. And it's very effective at taking exposures of different lengths and calibrating them in the same stack and keeping high quality. So it, there's a lot of things you can do to to speed up your acquisition. Maybe you're taking some narrow band subs and you decide, well, I'm not really swamped with the read noise. I want some longer subs. This is a great way to do it without adding too much to your workflow. Um, it's a really easy process. You just hit a, your home directory. You go to the sequence tab for conversion. You convert all your, your files to a cloned uh, FITS file. You do your pre-processing, just link it to your flat and dark. Uh, then you go to a background extraction and you just do, a, in this case, a 1D polynomial across the frame. And this corrects your background gradient each sub at a time. Um, for any of you that have tried to image a really long exposure, uh, as the object moves through the skies, you have different light domes and you end up with all of these arcing gradients in your light pollution. And after it's stacked, it's almost impossible to remove it uh, fully. You know, you, you have to resort to pretty heavy handed background flattening tools that that actually take some of the signal away with it as well. So definitely recommend removing the background each sub at a time prior to aligning and which this can do essentially automatically and uh, give you a good stack at the end. So again, you can do a linear fit clipping. Um, I've used a range of subs. This was using a Windsorized clip uh, using just the 360 subs. And you can see how weak that is. This is combining everything together, the 180 seconds, the 360 seconds, the 600 seconds at the same time. And if I look at the rejection and noise uh, scheme, it's actually excellent uh, in the end. So definitely recommend Surreal. Um, this is an example of the background extraction. This was a green sub. You can see I have a, an actual angled gradient, which is more of a 2D gradient. Uh, the 1D overcorrects, the 2D isn't quite perfect, but gets it pretty close. And then my final subs, um, basically my luminance is here, my red is here, blue, green, and H alpha uh, for that image. So really happy with that workflow. Um, you know, final image was here, but again, 28 hours to get to it. So 
that's hard. I don't like broadband for that reason. So let's move on to narrow band, which is why we're all here. Um, taking all that knowledge we just learned of how to plan our target still applies to narrow band. It's just so much easier. This image uh, was first done with just uh, basically five hours of imaging, way better than 28. The colors are much more rich. The background's more clean. Uh, this is why you spend money on those three to six narrow band image or filters. So what does this look like? So you remember the previous broadband sub, you know, my signal was maybe eight electrons or so. Well, in the case of this target, this is, you know, SH2132, uh, the, out of the Sharpless catalog, you can see H alpha maybe is, you know, signal maybe 20, 25. My O3 is even weaker. It's only an ADU of six. And then my S2 is even weaker, only an ADU of two across the background, which in the end comes out to just one electron. So this is much dimmer than the previous target, uh, yet I can expose uh, total integration much less. So big benefit to narrow band. It basically removes all your light pollution. And that's what I'm comparing here, right? Previous example, 20 hours for 10 levels of signal to noise. If I look at this previous example here for H alpha, uh, which is my main sub, I only need two hours to be at the same level of detail. You know, again, from a mortal five. So this is a key benefit. Um, you know, process the same, same way in Surreal, right? Do the conversions, uh, do the pre-process, remove your darks, remove your flats, do the background extraction. Uh, I have the times listed here. Um, total number of subs, I think ended up being somewhere around 100, um, or sorry, 66 frames, there we go. So conversion, three seconds, pre-processing just over two minutes, background extraction, three minutes, registration, five minutes, and then depending on your stacking, maybe 10 minutes or so. Um, so again, the linear fit clipping, target your 0.1 to 0.5% rejection, and then this is just the resulting screen uh, stretch in the end. So pretty quick, only takes 20 minutes to do a full calibration. Um, really happy with, with this as a free software. So then moving into star tools, um, this is how I process uh, all my images and narrowband in particular, I'll get to the color balancing uh, at the end of this. Uh, but the key with star tools um, is that each pixel, pixel's noise evolution is tracked from start to finish. And this software isn't free, but it's pretty cheap. And again, I've used PixInsight as well. I have also Astro Pixel Processor. Uh, star tools is what I go to every time I'm processing an image for the first time, because uh, I can get a result pretty quickly, you know, within two or three hours that I'm really happy with. And I can jump to picks inside later if I want to spend, you know, two or three days or even a week sometimes uh, to try to get the same result. Um, but if you want 90% or even 95% of what picks inside could do, uh, it's a pretty easy software to use. It's a graphical use, user interface for most of it. The tools are laid out exactly how you would use them in your workflow. And because everything is tracked, you can actually jump around. It's not it's not like uh, PixInsight where you have to worry about going from linear to nonlinear and having to go back several steps. It, it's actually uh, pretty user-friendly in that regard. So jumping through the first thing you do, um, you know, usually you end up having to bin your, your images, right? You'll look at, you'll zoom in on a star. Uh, you'll see, okay, how many pixels is it covering? If it's covering six or seven pixels, you need to reduce the resolution because your blur is too big. And by reducing the resolution, you improve your signal to noise. Um, next step, you go through and you crop your stacking artifacts because your stacking is never perfect. And in my case, I always um, do the dithering during acquisition, every frame with narrow band. So I, I use a pretty aggressive dither, so it will move 10 to 15 pixels each time. <clears throat> Sorry, jumped ahead too much there. All right, uh, the first thing you use is a tool called auto develop, but it's not really auto develop. What it does is it's looking at every roughly, you can change it, but every 256 pixel square, it's looking at the lo local contrast variation and trying to extract 
the maximum local contrast it can. So there's a lot of tools that you need to adjust uh, within this. Uh, there's a lot of sliders here. Uh, the first thing you do is take your ignore fine detail parameter and you increase it until the background stops darkening. And if you have matched your system to your sky, uh, that ignore fine detail number a lot of times can be left off or maybe just one and a half pixels. Uh, if you find that you're using three or four or seven pixels, it means that you don't have enough resolution or enough signal in your data to use that high of a resolution. You'll need to go back and bin further. So the first thing you do is set this, then you have to adjust your gamma. And what I found is if you use a gamma less than one, um, you can see the nebulosity still comes out pretty good, uh, but there's a huge benefit on the stars. You can't see it in this picture, but the star profile is way better with a lower gamma. And then if you want to adjust the background brightness, that's where you look at the shadow detail moving from maybe between a 20 and a 30, depending on where your gamma is at. So some adjustment here uh, where I typically end up uh, maybe a gamma between 80 and 90 for most images, I move that shadow linearity to maybe 25%. And as I mentioned, you know, maybe a, a one or one and a half for the dark anomaly pixel. And I have that histogram here, which you can see is in the same ballpark of where a lot of those astrobin reference images are. So try to make sure I'm roughly in that ballpark uh, for an aesthetic image. The next tool you use is contrast. And again, this is gl global level contrast. Again, it's slider based. Um, essentially what you want to do is set your brightness retention to the global mode aligned first. This keeps your same brightness as your final auto-developed result. And you want to then adjust your shadow dynamic range to focus on the, the background shadows while leaving the nebulosity. And you want to make sure that you're focusing on a visual reasonable size of pixels, in this case, maybe 10 to 15 pixels or so. So you can vary it around. This is the effect of moving um, the shadow noise here. You can see high and low, there's kind of a big difference. And then moving top to bottom, this is your locality strength of it. You know, so kind of low level strength, high level strength, same ratio here. You know. You don't want to do a heavy hand on these global adjustments. So final contrast adjustment is here. You can see here's the histogram rising up 10%, um, kind of peaks out at 20 and flattens out to almost nothing by 50. Again, this is kind of your ideal profile you'd be looking for. Um, now you want to work on, okay, this is my global image looks pretty good, but it's kind of soft. So then I want to work on my detail, you know, bringing out HDR and the highlights, sharpen. I like to focus more on the darkest structures, uh, avoiding over sharpening the bright structures. There's some deconvolution you can do to tighten stars. Although I, for most of my images, I don't use deco deconvolution. I think it makes kind of a harsh profile um, a lot of times, but there's a few few times it's necessary. And then to really treat those stars well, I look at the superstructure tool, which has a kind of a background noise isolation uh, uh, regime that it uses. So H, for HDR, again, you're focusing on the brightest portion. Um, we can see a big adjustment here if I look at the um, overall detail size range. If I make it really uh, small, and then if I make my uh, response um, very low, uh, this is a very, very light effect here, but it focuses on the small detail. If I increase the detail size, it, you can see it pulls out more the larger structures versus the very small pixel structures. So using this detail size range around a thousand is a good number for problems, if you move the strength too high, you can see down here, we have a lot of clumpiness on the small pixel scale. This looks like very high frequency noise. And if you use a high strength with a high detail size range, you can see it's almost like looking at mashed potato in the end. So again, HDR is something I use very light. I only use a strength of maybe 1.1. Uh, 1, .1. 1 is off, essentially. I use a bright dark response 
um, maybe 1.1 to 1.3. So again, focusing more on the bright structures and the dark structures, because I'll use sharpen for the dark structures and keeping the detail size range fairly large between 600 and 1200 pixels, depending on the overall size of the image. No, so that final HDR image is here. You can see that a lot more of the structure in the bright nebulosity has come out. Moving to sharp, you need an inverse star mask. Uh, default values work fine for that within star tools. Um, for sharpen, you have a choice of scale. You can use small scale, medium, or large. Uh, typically I use medium because that's where most of the interesting features come in. Uh, so first thing, right, is again, I got all the sliders here. I realize they're a little bit hard to see, um, but you can vary uh, the scale that you're sharpening, you know, single pixel, two pixel, four, eight, 16 pixel. You can vary the amount. Um, typically I use 300 to 500%. So sounds high, but not so much. Uh, dark light enhance. Um, I really like to focus on the dark uh, so I'll, I'll pull the slider to the left. You can see it really pulls out um, all the clouds and globules in front of the nebula. Uh, and then, you know, signal to noise bias, you know, you want to leave that high as well. If you change the signal to noise bias low, it, it doesn't care what it's sharpening. So it will take your noise, it will make it too sharp. So you want to leave it focused on high signal to noise. Uh, and again, I use it to focus on the darks because I use HDR for the bright items. So again, here's the result. Histogram still unchanged, but we can see now we have the bright detail in the nebula and we have the dark clouds brought out, the wispiness. <clears throat> Deconvolution, as I mentioned, you know, use it lightly. Um, you need a star mask. So I just basically take the same one I had and for my sharpen, I invert it, I keep that. I save it for later as well. There's a lot of um, a lot of math that goes into picking right numbers for this. So this is slider based, but it's actually one of the more complicated to do things to do, uh, even when you consider the picks insight tools as well. Um, it's it's best to, in this case, change your spatial error. Uh, I found a default to one, but that assumes you got perfectly round stars. So you use one minus your star eccentricity. Uh, dynamic range extension you would use if all your stars are clipped. Uh, you would have to adjust that a little bit, but it will affect your background brightness as well. Uh, linearity cutoff, uh, if you have a good sensor close to one, uh, the, the ASI 1600 I needed to use is closer to 80. Um, the DSLR really needed about 50%. So it really depends on the quality of your sensor. Uh, iterations, you don't want to increase too much. Uh, again, um, if you do it too much, it will become very harsh. Uh, really it's best at maybe seven or five iterations or so. And then you're using your synthetic point spread function and model. And in this case, I've already kind of matched my system's resolution. So I'm using a pretty small radius you know, just 1.4 pixels. So it tightens up the stars a little bit. Um, but if it was really blurry, you could go as high as two. You just have to be careful about the dark halos around the stars. If you had the dark halos, then you'd have to increase the D-ringing, uh, increase the, what's called D-ringing fuzz, which is just the, the blur uh, filter that they put over it. So a lot of things you can change in here. Um, it's really hard to get a good result with the decon. So generally I don't use it, um, but if I do use it, it's for really light hand. Now, what I do use though, is the superstructure has an isolation tab. And really what this is, is it's a, um, it's a compost algorithm that takes the old image and generates a new one based on a gamma correction and a, a multiply step. Uh, again, you want your brightness retention on, keeping the local median, so it doesn't really change the overall brightness of the image so much. Um, but again, kind of being careful with this, but you can see, maybe you can see, uh, there's a little bit of noise and speckleness in the clouds and background that cleans up quite nicely. Um, using a medium strength, you keep still the frequency there. It doesn't go away completely. Uh, so it still looks natural, but it does a good job of uh, bringing the gas and smoothing it out from the clouds behind it. 
Uh, now, uh, this is actually really powerful within Star Tools because it's tracked everything you've done uh, from opening the file till now on a pixel level. So it knows which pixels have been stretched more than others. Uh, again, it's not a straight pixel or not a straight histogram stretch. It's doing it uh, kind of locally. Uh, and it will target its noise reduction scheme directly at those pixels that it views has gathered the most noise. So typically scale correlation, um, if you have this very high, that means from a single pixel to maybe an area 30 pixels across of the noise is correlated. That's pretty rare. Uh, so scale correlation is usually 30 to 50%. Um, typically only goes through maybe like a one to four pixel range. Brightness detail loss, again, because you're focusing it on single pixels, which you control by grain dispersion. Uh, sometimes this will be higher, maybe two or so, but if you're trying to focus on single pixels, that brightness detail loss will reduce the amplitude of the noise, but leave the noise in place, right? You don't want to eliminate the noise completely. That gives you a plastic looking picture. So you want to leave the noise, but reduce the magnitude. You can do that through brightness detail loss. And in terms of spreading it across pixels, you control that through the scale correlation. So you get pretty good picture there. Um, so after that, here's kind of the final zoom out. I pulled it into Lightroom, um, again, to check the histogram, see if there's any final tweaks, but I've got good detail in the brights, good detail in the darks, the star profiles are tight and uh, the point spread function looks pretty smooth. Uh, so pretty happy with this layer, you know, so then you go through with the sulfur and oxygen frames and do the same thing. Um, you know, auto develop contrast. The goal at the end of this though, is to make sure that your histograms are close in size to your H alpha signal. The quality won't be there, right? You'll have to use heavier denoise, but you wanna get the general brightness in the same ballpark, um, which you can kind of see here. Here's the H alpha, here's the O3, here's the S2. It's weaker, the histograms are there. They're shifted a little, but it's not so bad. Uh, so this is a good starting point for then moving into your color uh, color uh, strategies. So several options for color. Let's see, I may have lost a page. Actually want to do this page first. So you have several options for color, but really what you're trying to do is really bring out these rich uh, saturated colors, which if you do it on the O3 and S3 channels is gonna look like terrible detail, it'll be splotchy. Your stars will be having some trouble, but you're effectively trying to do a tone mapped routine or even a boosted tone map uh, routine. So Star Tools has a lot of options. You have a compost module, uh, you have some heavy handed tools. There's a heal function where you can remove stars. Uh, but the basic idea, this is what you would do in PixInsight or Photoshop, is you'd start with your HA, your O3, your S2. You could, if you really wanna boost it, you would go to a starless image right out of the gate, stretch it even more, and then make your color tone map. Then you would do a synthetic luminance with your original H alpha, which still has the stars and then the detail of your O3 and, or sorry, your O3 and your S2. Um, so you're getting the brightness from these, but you're keeping the stars from the H alpha that you didn't have to stretch so much. That gives you your synthetic lum. Then you add your color tone map from this combination to get kind of a, a really good standard uh, Hubble palette type image. Uh, right out of the gate. And then you can go another step and even try to boost it even more, you know, add your HA stretch luminance to this as well uh, to bring out that H alpha even more. But you've kept the star profiles intact and correct uh, through this process. This is really tedious as you can imagine because you're doing each one of these steps uh, either in Photoshop or PixInsight. Well, Star Tools actually has a lot of features where it can do this for you in the background which is a reason I can get a good image in a couple hours. So you can use their compost module. And again, very hard to see, but within compost, you can basically just pick up, you know, do I wanna do a red, green, blue image? Do I wanna do a luminance red, green, blue? Do I wanna do a luminance plus a synthetic luminance? A lot of options are right in there. 
Um, in this case, I just want to process the color layer, right? I'm not going to do any luminance from this, just color. So I just use a straight red, green, blue. Don't change the weight. This is what I get out of it. You can see from just the color, the resolution isn't there, but the color is. And I have some greens and yellows and blues and reds in there, which is a good range, which means I've stretched my three channels appropriately because I, I have a decent range, but it's still very green, right? So again, good mix of colors, but kind of green, don't like it that much. You know, so what can we do? Well, we can sharpen this again. So again, make your star mask, save it. Um, we've just sharpened it a little bit more, uh, pulled out some more of the details for color. So now I have kind of good color variation in the background. We can see individual clouds, uh, pretty happy starting point there before actually going into the color balancing module within star tools. So this is a really powerful tool. Um, there's a lot of kind of work bars in here, um, but my philosophy in general with narrowband images is that the dust clouds in the background should really have a little bit of a reddish tint to it. Uh, green as a standalone color is pretty rare in narrowband outside of a few planetary nebulas. You don't really see it. So really this green, I need to get more to a yellow. And the big picture as a whole is when we consider these tone mapped approaches, I'm taking two reds and a teal from my narrow band, and I'm trying to make an image that shows the most contrast difference between the mixtures of the elements. So I wanna take two reds and a teal and turn it to basically have components of every color in the rainbow. So I need to do some things here. Um, to make that happen. Within the color module, again, we see too much green. There's an option to cap green, which basically moves the midpoint more to yellow uh, than to green. Uh, we can see a little bit of improvement there. And then we can also see some of these stars have a little bit of a halo and a fringe on it. There's also a repair fringe in here as well. So you can bump that up to five pixels, six pixels, pixels depending on your, your image size. So this is the first step within color. Uh, the next step within color then is to choose um, your fundamental uh, color mapping scheme, which takes a, either a scientific approach or an artistic approach, right? Artistic basically lets you do whatever you want. You'll end up clipping some cl colors or mixing things together uh, or scientific, which tries to keep the, the actual uh, constancy of the color through the object, allowing you to compare actual uh, ionization uh, differences in the image. Like the difference color here would be similar over here following that method. So I, I typically keep the scientific color constancy on. Uh, I will bump up the saturation a little bit to balance between the light and dark. And then on the right hand side, you actually have your color balance mix. And we can see red and blue, which is my uh, sulfur and oxygen channels. They, on the auto white balance, they basically stayed at one, which means their histograms were matched. But my H alpha was a little bright, so it got adjusted by 30% in the natural color balance here. But from these pictures, you can see this one's a little more saturated, and it's because of that scientific color constancy. These two are the artistic ones, which you can see a little more washed out. So. That's the first step. Then, um, what do we do after that? Um, again, the, maybe it's a little bit washed out, so I wanna increase the saturation. There's two tabs, you have the picture itself and you have a tab that shows you what color the pixels are biased to um, at full saturation. So then you increase your actual saturation here and then you look at your color mixing strategies, right? And these color mixing strategies will take different weights, uh, red, green, blue um, for sulfur mixed with hydrogen or mixed with oxygen, depending on where you're at. But this gives you just an example. This one here is the one I choose. And it's a red is 50% sulfur, 50% hydrogen. Green is 50% hydrogen, 50% oxygen. And blue is just 100% oxygen. And it gives me that full range of color, right? I, I got the red, the orange, the yellow, the green, the teal, the blue, a little bit of purple. So 
that's really what I'm looking for to show the difference in the ionizations, which again is shown here. You can see the final color mix here. Again, I had to reduce my H alpha bias a little bit, but I got my color matrix, the highlight repair, the cap and green on, adjust the saturation amounts and the highlights and the darks as needed. You know, zoomed in, you know, pretty good, just a little bit hazy, because again, we're working on the color channel. Should be hazy. A uh, few other things you could do then is, okay, a little bit hazy, let's bring the color out more. You can go back into superstructure. There's a saturate tab that will basically really stretch these without clipping. Um, but that's too heavy handed. I don't use it too much. Um, generally, again, keeping the global modes aligned, you know, I get this sort of mix. And you see the stars have red, blue, uh, yellow colors in them. So not only is the nebula well balanced, I also have the good star, star colors in here. Uh, but again, most of these, most of these mixes here are presets. So you can kind of flip through pretty quickly uh, the various color palettes you like. Uh, and you don't have to redo it in pixel math over and over again that you'd be doing in pixel inside. So this is much faster. You can actually, it only takes roughly a minute to jump between each one of these if you really want to see. All right, uh, with the color, you got to go through another round of denoise. So only difference here, again, I'm still only using one pixel. Color detail loss, I bump up maybe 50% or so. Um, so it gets rid of any of that red fringing or purple fringing that might be on the stars, uh, brings it back towards neutral. So at this point, right, now we have our luminance and we have our color channel, right? This was the final color channel. We had our H alpha luminance on the other one. How do I want to combine these together? Well, in the compost module, you can do a straight L red, green, blue which would be here, or you can do an L plus synthetic L red, green, blue, which is here. Again, this is more similar to that tone map approach. Uh, you can see there's a big improvement in dynamic uh, contrast, which looks great. But if I were to zoom in on this, the added brightness actually reduced my detail because it's coming from that color channel that doesn't actually have detail in the sulfur or oxygen channel. So I don't like either of these options. Um, I actually use this second option, which is the layer module, uh, to do a mix of the H alpha, my primary luminance, my color layer uh, to make a composite. And you can extract the color from the foreground, uh, which gets really close, but you have to renormalize the histogram. And I was off a little bit in my color or in my brightness, as I mentioned. So it did shift my histogram slightly to the right, but still completely acceptable for where I'm trying to go. So again, you can see um, H alpha stars are good. Uh, detail is sharp. You can see colors maybe a little more blurry in the middle. Stars are a little more bloated, but the composite uh, took the best of both of these. Has the full color, a little bit brighter dynamic range uh, than just the H alpha itself and kept all the necessary detail. And some small tweaks in Lightroom. As I mentioned, my histogram got pushed to the right, so I pulled it back by adjusting the black point, but this is basically the final product there. So moving into some more advanced items and almost done, I think we're down to the last six or seven slides. Um, to make a starless image, uh, again, this is kind of using the sharpened star mask from before. So you'll end up reusing that same one over and over again. There is an option in star tools to make a a starless image. You can also use StarNet, which is an AI tool. You can use Photoshop, Dust and Scratches. Many ways to do this, um, but within Star Tools, if you have your star mask, uh, it's pretty easy to use. Um, you know, just bump the quality up, grow the mass, neighborhood area, maybe 100 pixels, take a few samples. Uh, I took, you know, this image with the stars. And after about five minutes of processing, it spits out the whole image here. And then this is a zoomed in area, which you can see does quite a good job. Uh, and I've gotten better results out of this than I have with um, the StarNet for sure. Um, dust and scratches, you can almost get to this with enough iterations. So um, 
if we take this out, now we're starless, uh, we go back to that tone mapping routine again, you know, where, okay, we remove the star so we can push the histogram more or increase the sharpening. So if I'm at this point, I will resharpen the image. Uh, I'll get a little bit more detail out of here. Uh, I think this one actually is the sharpened image. But then you have to go back and add your stars in. And in this case, I would use red, green, blue stars, um, stretch it a little bit in star tools, do the color balance for it, use that layer module again and add it back to the sharpened image. So you can do it this way. Um, pretty good quality overall. Um, so a lot of freedom in how you treat it. Uh, the next is remodeling the stars. This is a unique feature in star tools, but you can put in the specs of your telescope, you know, refractor, uh, you know, Newtonian, you know, another number of veins you have, mirror quality, blur in the function, any offsets that you might have with screws or anything protruding. And you can actually model the point spread function of the star based on your optics aperture. And using that mask, you can actually get really good results. You can see here, this is the before. Um, we have some bright stars, but they're a little blocky. A uh, few of them have clipped. And using the remodel, the clipping goes away. I now actually have a good star profile that's based on the specs of my optics. So it's not necessarily real light, but it's using the lights that there, it's using the color that's there. It's using the spec of your optics, if you set it correctly, to regenerate what this point, point spread function should look like for your star, which is a pretty cool feature. And it actually looks better uh, than doing the star replacement with red, green, blue uh, stars in the end. So final image is here, um, just cropped it. So it looks like a globe and continents, kind of cool, I think, but it's my final image. Uh, and then there's a big discussion on, okay, what about AI tools that are showing up? So there's a lot of debate on this image here, which is using mathematically reversible techniques. Um, I'm in the camp of, you know, I, it's my image as long as I can explain what happened and uh, the mathematics is there to get back to the original image. There's another camp of, well, what about these AI tools, which are adding detail to images? And some of the background there, I do work with AI tools uh, in my day job. Effectively, what they're doing is they're taking an image, they're decomposing it into several, uh, several size blocks to pull out the local contrast on multiple scales. So that local contrast for both brightness and color is then mapped digitally and put in this pretty big database. Right, so it can do this with the picture you're working on, and then it will compare this map to several other maps that it's generated uh, that aren't complete pictures, right? They, these are very small pixel scale level contrast routines where it needs to make a guess on what you're trying to achieve, but then it uses what it knows human eyes like to see to add detail and augment detail to spit out the other image. So there's some tools that exist through Topaz. So you know, Topaz Studio has an AI clear function, which you can see from this image to this image, it actually got quite a bit sharper, uh, but actually the stars are warped now. You know, it doesn't do a good job with astro images and stars. So you can tell images on AstroBin that have had this tool applied to it because, you know, stars don't really look like stars anymore. Um, you can use adjust, right? I already have pretty bold colors, but you can use a AI adjust, which will then guess, hey, look at this. We have now something that looks like a Yellowstone pool, but actually some of these contrast gradients aren't possible to pull out of the histogram, right? So it, it stretches things in a nonlinear way um, that it thinks you would like to see. And to be fair, it does look pretty cool, but that's not the real image. Um, so at the same time, you know, there's some mask and waiting. So it's, you can add some detail and augment without it destroying the image. But I think at the end of the day, it's fake. Um, you know, there's some, you know, denoise tools and sharpening tools that add a lot of detail. Uh, the dark clouds actually start to look like fur, animal fur or eyelashes. 
uh, pretty easy to spot as well. Um, so is there a place for AI tools? There is, um, particularly when it comes to getting settings and you know, trying to optimize the image routine it is. I, I think that's great. When it comes to breaking the math, I don't really like it so much. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, each imager can use what tool they want, uh, which is really the consensus. You know, if you use it, uh, ideally, you know, if you publish it, you should, you know, explain, okay, here's the software I use, list the software. So it's like, yeah, it's, there's some augmentation, but you know, it's the tools are trying to get better such that it's very subtle improvements. And as long as they're subtle improvements, that seems to be where the community is going, that that it's generally allowed as long as, you know, people are up front and say, yeah, I'm using these things. So for me, I I have them on a few of my images, but they're disclosed. I generally don't like it after I've tried for a little bit. So this one here is completely real image, mathematically reversible and happy with the level of detail I'm able to get out of it. So, all right, that's it for the presentation. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Do we have any questions? You can unmute yourself and ask a question. All right, and I do intend to you know, PDF this and make it available to everyone if you'd like to review it. Yeah, I can include a link in the uh, YouTube video. Okay. I can put it in the newsletter too. All right, so no questions? Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. So uh, just before I do, though, thanks again, Jonathan, for really putting it together. I know that was quite a bit of work from putting too many PowerPoints together myself. So <laughs> really appreciate the time and effort. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. I just kind of did the last processing of that narrowband uh, picture a couple days ago and just made the PowerPoint as I went. So that whole thing uh, only took about four and a half hours. Okay. So hey, Richard, I do have a question. Oh, sure. Hey Jonathan, what was what's your what was your uh, process or thought for going from Pix Insight over to this this software package? It's more like time saving? As yeah, just time saving. Um, yeah, I have Pix Insight. I use it. You saw all those quality graphs came out of Pix Insight, and mm -hmm. you know it for processing. Um, I can get better results in Pix Insight, but mm -hmm. I need to spend days to do it. And right. Right. I, I don't have that much time with the kids. So Star Tools is a pretty good first shot at all my images. And mm -hmm. if I have one that I think is particularly good, and I'll move to Fix Insight. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of like the same boat I'm in. I, I have good data and it takes like forever to process. Yeah. And it'd be nice to be able to process quickly. And then if it looks like it's really good data. You know. Yep. Yeah, that's where I ended up in the end. So. Okay, great. Thanks. Anybody else? All right, let's uh, move on. So uh, we'll go through the usual uh, agenda here if you downloaded the agenda. So um, first, I just wanted to thank everyone that shared uh, images during Astrophotography Night at the general meeting earlier this month. Um, really appreciate, again, members uh, participating, which has been lacking a bit during the pandemic. And uh, there'll be more uh, chances to participate here in the near future, as I'll mention later. But um, with that said, does anyone have any new images they haven't shared during Astrophoto Night or couldn't attend Astrophoto Night? Anybody want to share anything? This yeah. time I've got nothing. Pete, go ahead. Yeah, I do. It's kind of most, well, it's almost complete. If I can ever get clear skies, but this is the Gamma Cygni region with my um, um, uh, Sharp Star 61 refractor. It's just an LRGB image right now, um, uh, processed in Pix Insight, as you can see. <laughs> but um, if I can ever get my HL flag, I only got one frame currently to help you know boost the HL flag areas. But um, it's about all I got. Actually, I do have a, quite a bit of. Um, uh, M42, I'm starting to work on, but that's gonna 
probably take months to get the data for it. But, um, but yeah, I've been pretty happy with this. This has been one area of the sky I've been kind of wanting to go after. So I've been pretty pleased with this. Nice little scope. Little refractors are pretty cool. Might have to get a big refractor someday. That's looking good. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Pete. Yep. Actually, Jonathan, it was a really good uh, analysis you did with the histogram for the astral bin. I don't know if that was something that you did as far as looking where they where they peaked out the, the image of the day. So I was kind of looking at where I was actually on this image, and I was pretty close. I had to pull my black point back a little bit. It's something I've noticed over the last year or so is that all of the image of the days and top picks have the same profile. So mm -hmm. either the judges all like that the best or it, it is actually what people like the most. But one thing I didn't mention is on the printing side of things, mm -hmm. we do need to shift the histogram more to the middle because printers yeah. are assuming that your peak is at that 50% line. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So unless you're using something like Bay Photo, which mm -hmm. makes awesome images uh, yep. they can ha they can handle the that unadjusted histogram just fine but most print shops can't do it oh okay yeah i'm just starting to get into printing some of my work and yeah it's been a interesting journey <laughs> yeah yeah it doesn't match at all right <laughs> no <laughs> it's taken a few attempts and yeah you're right it's really shifting it yeah. yeah i tried to print that orion nebula image you processed i have it on the wall but it doesn't look nearly as good as the image on the screen yeah That'll probably be a good uh, topic for this SIG is uh, uh, commercial printing or just yeah. printing of images. Yeah. That's why I miss Kalamazoo Color Lab. They always knew how to adjust for astrophotography. Oh, they're, they're gone. Yeah, so they're gone. For oh, prints, man. I do recommend these acrylic blocks with the metal oh. prints in the back. It's a little dark, mm -hmm. but actually it, it's got a lot of really good depth to it. Oh, nice. And they're a little, they're a little pricey for the size, but... Mm -hmm. um, but turn out better than the metal prints. Oh, and, really? And I've been doing this long enough that my wife is not allowing me to put any more big prints on the wall. So these Ooh. little things work good on a bookshelf. Oh, you oh, got to no. have a man cave where you can put up whatever you want. Oh, well, yeah. kids have a rotation system. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a few at work that she doesn't know about. So there you go. Nice. <laughs> um. I've been messing around with mosaics on the remote telescope. So I think this is this is like the first one that I had done. It's just uh, like an auto stretch with six panels. It's pretty messy seems, but um, the next project I'm doing is M33 and I already have four panels. I just need a lot more data. <laughs> All right, that's great. Yeah, I, I, I noticed you were working on those mosaics. And the, yeah, the Andromeda one's coming along. Mm -hmm. Just got to get that no good moon out of the way. <laughs> Any other images anybody wanted to share? Uh, moving on, um, interesting images from other astrophotographers. Of course, uh, Jonathan showed some tonight. There have been two on uh, APOD this week. I don't know if I'll go back and share them, but like, Yesterday or the day before, there was like a 40-hour image, you know, like an HOO image of the Helix Nebula. That was pretty yeah. impressive. I, I think I, I think it was at least 40 hours of data, or maybe it was more. But you can go back to APOD, you know, the astronomy picture of the day, and check that out. And then um, the one for today, I, I forget the galaxy, specific galaxy. It's uh, NGC... Uh, 289 from someone named uh, Mike Selby. I'm not quite sure the specifics of that, but I would encourage everyone to check that out too. So basically, if you don't check out APOD every day, you should because mm -hmm. there's lots of good sample images on there. There's also an amateur APOD. It's aapod2.com. Yeah. They usually have good stuff, but uh, APOD. I got to check that out. So uh, next wow. is, oh, oh I, for, I forgot to bring this up. Um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, does anyone have any uh, new astrophotography related equipment or software that you've either purchased or heard about? I just ordered something. Oh, God, what'd you get? 
No, I didn't order the plane wave. I, I, <laughs> I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that one. Um, I ordered a sky alert, which is a weather. It's a, for my observatory, um, for monitoring clouds, range, you know, all that good okay. stuff. So when I'm sleeping, it'll shut up everything. And I did have one, um, I had from, um, a place called Astral Smart. Um, I just haven't been really happy with it. Um, this from the product itself and then just the business itself, honestly. So I ordered the Sky Alert. Um, I a lot of good reviews from it and how it integrates with SGP and just in general. So hopefully I'll get that here this next week and then still have clouds probably for another few weeks after that. But hopefully it'll improve my um, data collection uh, a little, mo little bit more so I can just have it open up take images, little, those little peep, peep holes that we get once in a while. Yeah, it's the whole peace of mind, you know. Yeah. Being, being able to sleep is hard when you have your stuff out in the front yard, at least in my case. Yeah, well, last last summer, I when I had my, before I had my observatory, it, clear night, and then all of a sudden it was pouring at two o'clock in the morning, and my, my, my camera was still collecting open shutter, and I had my, uh, yeah, I had covering it up and man that was the biggest heart attack i ever had yep. so yeah, i've been there then i got to tell a gizmo cover which is awesome yeah um, those are great yeah still don't want to have to use it though no, no that's a so that's all i got all right i got an email recently from astronomy technology today about their new issue which i typically don't read i don't i'm so behind on my reading but when i did i I did decide to visit their website and saw uh, these. Uh, so there's these new kind of dedicated solar uh, cameras. Uh, you know, they're called the Apollo series and there's, you know, various uh, sized uh, sensors, I suppose. Hmm. And, you know, the prices aren't terribly extreme. I think, I don't think they're listed on here anywhere, but they were uh, probably in the $400, $500 range, which, you know, for cameras isn't too bad. So, because um, I remember, you know, a few weeks ago, Henry and I were out at Owl Observatory trying to do some solar imaging, and the camera we have out there, the ZWO camera, we specifically have the O71 one. I don't uh, think it's quite um, good enough for solar imaging, at least not properly equipped for solar imaging. So I was looking at these. I don't know, of course, the board won't probably go for it. Because they'll just say, well, no one will ever use them. Like, well, I'll use them. But, 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 that's all I care about. <laughs> uh, so these look really interesting. So um, just wanted to uh, point that out, that now there are some dedicated solar cameras out there. And just to remind people, we do have a 90 millimeter Coronado filter that you can attach to the Teleview out there if you want to do solar imaging, you know, come, come the spring or summer again. Of course, it's getting into the season where we're not even going to see the sun, let alone the stars uh, anymore. So th that's some new equipment that caught my uh, eye this past month. Mm -hmm. Any other new uh, equipment that anyone purchased or noticed? All right. So just remember, you got to keep an eye on that stuff so you can uh, uh, share some stuff at future meetings. Uh, just a few things to mention. I just want to again mention the uh, KAS Remote Telescope. Jonathan was mentioning, you know, spending fifty thousand plus dollars. If you want to use a setup that's you know hundred thousand dollars, we have the KAS Remote Telescope, and as Jonathan showed, there's software that's either free or low price that you can use to process the image. So, so you have access to, you know, a high-end uh, telescope. We have the twenty-inch plane wave, the uh, four-inch Takahashi with two. STX 16803 CCD cameras. They're $12,000 plus cameras. They're not made anymore because everyone's switching over to CMOS now as, as opposed to CCDs, but they are still excellent full frame cameras with the full suite of filters. We have the LRGB filters and we do have the three nanometer Astrodon narrowband filters, which are as sharp as hell. So they are available to use. And I just want to keep uh, mentioning that and I just want to mention that again, I'm encouraging members to, you know, work together, talk about it here about group projects. So I mentioned, you know, if anyone wants to help me uh, collect images of the Rosette Nebula when it kind of comes in the more prime view, 
this season. I, I just barely got a start of that last er, earlier this year of doing this large uh, uh, project of the Rosette Nebula with the narrowband filters. And if anyone wants to share telescope time, that would be great. And we, just to again mention, we do have Owl Observatory. I know um, both Anna and Henry have the observatory reserved this uh, Sunday and Monday. And they did mention they would share. So if anyone wants to go out there and take pictures with them, they'll be out there taking pictures uh, on Sunday night and Monday night. So, you know, it's great to get people out there working together. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention is uh, basically participation at, during the uh, astrophotography SIG. For those of you that attended the general meeting, you, you know, you heard my little rant there. Because, uh, you know, to, to be blunt, during the pandemic, I've been running the club basically all by myself uh, the past couple of years dur during this pandemic. And it's kind of getting a little wear and tear on me. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to start meeting in person again in January. Um, but, you know, as far as speakers, you know, some, some members did suggest uh, places that, that I could find speakers, which was incredibly helpful. And I really appreciate that. And uh, so I'll, you know, I'll probably usually work on the general meetings by myself, but I just want to give you a warning when it comes to the Astro Photo SIG, uh, when it comes, you know, maybe next spring, when we start working on speakers for, you know, uh, the 2022-2023 season of SIG meetings, if it's going to be, again, me doing speakers by myself, I'll tell you right now, there's not going to be another season of the astrophotography SIG because this is where I absolutely demand people that participate in SIG meetings help me out. So we're always looking, you know, for, for, for guest speakers for the SIG. You know, of course, there could be members. Uh, so you could, you know, um, maybe talk with a member and see if they want to volunteer or if you just want to outright volunteer, that's the easiest thing to do is just have people email me and say, hey, I would like to give her an astro photo presentation. I'd be like, well, mm -hmm. hey, great. That, that, that takes off ha half the work of me having to track somebody down. And, you know, again, if you watch a cool YouTube video of someone that, you know, does processing demonstrations or something like that, or you visit another club's website that has a SIG and they have cool speakers, you know, make a list, create like a little text file or word file or whatever, and start making a list of uh, speakers uh, that you would like to see uh, at, at SIG meetings. And, you know, we're not limited to just meetings either. We could do what we did uh, earlier this year where Pete did a demo, uh, you know, processing with Pix Insight, you know, so Pete, we could do more, standalone meetings with just you know just processing workshops people could just watch people process and ask questions you know jonathan you could do that with surreal and star tools just spend mm -hmm. spend an hour or two just kind of going through processing we could you know record it people could watch it back over and over again and practice their techniques you know maybe we can even make uh, certain data sets of images available either from the remote telescope or your personal images where people could download the images and watch your video and practice processing techniques. Mm -hmm. So those are things we can do away from meetings. And I did try to do some workshops, you know, out at the observatory this summer, but we had fairly low participation, but I'm hoping maybe once the SIG gets going, uh, maybe more people will be willing to do, um, you know, workshops where we go out to the observatory, do imaging. We can even go over to people's houses when we can actually do that again and not fear of spreading disease, uh, mm -hmm. you know. So we can do all kinds of stuff like that. So, you know, there, there's a lot more we can do than just have, you know, SIG meetings either here on Zoom or eventually at Western when we get to go there for the first time. So, um, don't think uh, the SIG meetings will be like general meetings where basically it's me finding people alone. If I don't have help, uh, that's going to be it. This is not going to last very long. So I, I, I'm, again, demanding people participate in putting SIG meetings together. It, it, it ain't going to be me alone. That, that ain't going to happen. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is the presentation for next month. I really tried. I swear I did. Uh, I've never had such a hard time finding the guest speaker for kind of a topic idea that I had, which is a hard place to start. Um, 
you know, years ago, Pete will remember this. Pete's probably the only one that was here. But before we did the holiday party in December, uh, for, for a few years there, when Mike Sinclair first became president, we did something called, you know, great gifts for the amateur astronomer. You know, usually it was John Kirchhoff that came, you know, when he was at Writers here in Kalamazoo, the local hobby shop here in town, and, you know, brought some cool things you could buy for yourself or have your family buy for you for the holiday season. So I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool to have, you know, great gifts for the astrophotographer? And I emailed three different companies like, you know, OPT Astronomics and never heard back. I emailed three different people to see if they'd be willing to give a presentation. They either said no or never contacted me. Uh, so what I'm hoping to do is over the next month, you know, between now and the next SIG meeting, which is November 19th, uh, have everyone email me you know, maybe two or three items that maybe you own uh, that you really like or items that you would like to get, you know, as maybe gifts or eventually for yourself. And I could put the PowerPoint together. You know, I'm, I'm pretty prolific at putting PowerPoints together these days. So uh, email me your equipment suggestions. And as we go through the PowerPoints, you know, each member could talk about the gift they selected. I'd like to have at least a top 10 list of top 10 gifts or, you know, uh, product ideas you would like to buy. It could be, you know, a camera, telescope, software, filters, whatever. But, you know, at least get three different items from each member. So because I'm guessing we'll have overlaps, uh, but I can kind of pick uh pick and choose and I'll email you back and say, well, look, okay, you talk about this, you talk about this, you talk about this. You know, if you only spend like 40 minutes doing it, that's fine. Not every talk has to be, you know, an hour or more. We can just do like a 40 minute uh, topic of, uh, you know, cool gadgets and gizmos to buy for, for the holiday season. So I'll kind of give you an email reminder about that, but this is your first chance and your first kind of you know, uh, a signed job for the meeting next month it is, is again, uh, pick out a few gadgets to, to share. And I'll tell you which ones you can talk about. You, you can throw together your own PowerPoint, but I think it would be more smooth to have one PowerPoint that we work through instead of, you know, okay, you share your screen, then you share your screen, then you share your screen, because it's kind of clunky. So I figured one PowerPoint, but each person can share um, maybe one or two gadgets to, to, uh, to do. So that's what I want to try, because like I said, I tried to find someone to give a solo presentation about this, but I couldn't. I could not find anybody. Everyone uh, turned me down or just ignored me. So that's all I have. Uh, anybody else want to mention anything or have any comments about what I talked about? Okay, well, that's a place to start. There's nowhere to go but up from here. Uh, so uh, thanks for joining us for the um, October uh, meeting of the Astrophotography SIG. Thanks for joining us.